I should apologize in advance for the sound emanating from my window. The neighbors are having fun in the pestilential sun. Although, even though, we are in the throes of a pandemic and a lockdown, a shutdown, a close down. So from time to time, you will hear my reveling neighbors as they revel. We left off, uh, my name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A, reading my English translation of Beyond Good and Evil, Jenseits von Gut und Böse, von, uh, by Friedrich Nietzsche. And we left off with paragraph, or rather aphorism, 72. I will call them paragraphs. It is not the strength, but the duration of high sentiments that constitutes the higher human beings. Paragraph 73. Whoever reaches one's ideal, thereby goes beyond it. 73a. Many people, excuse me, many peacocks hide their peacock's tails from every eye and call this their pride. 74. A person of genius is unbearable unless he or she possess at least two other things besides thankfulness and purity. In other words, self-deprecation. Geniuses are intolerable unless they pretend to lower themselves, unless they deprecate themselves, even ironically. 75. The degree and kind of a person's sexuality extends to the highest peak of one's spirit. This aphorism must have made an impact. It must have made a deep impression on Freud, who did write about this. Um, why is it, Freud wondered, that so many intellectuals are voyeurists, voyeurs, peeping Toms and peeping Teresas, scopophiliacs, why is that? Well, it, it's not the case really that intellectuals have this paraphilia because they're intellectually curious? No, no, it's the exact opposite. Freud posited that these are people who are voyeuristic and thereby become intellectuals. So in other words, their intellectuality, their intellectual curiosity, their research, is nothing more than a sublimation of their voyeuristic impulses. 76. Under peaceful conditions, warlike people assault themselves. I thought about translating that word um, as bellicose. You know, the word that I translated as warlike is bellicose, but I thought that isn't direct enough. I, I wrestled with that, but I went for warlike. 77. With principles someone seeks to tyrannize or defend or honor or abuse or conceal his or her tendencies. Two people with the very same principles probably seek fundamentally different things for that very reason. Isn't that interesting? So what he's saying is first come the unconscious instinctive tendencies the proclivities, the inclinations, the predilections, which are by no means rational, which are pre-rational, which are pre-intellectual, right? Pre-conscious, pre-reflective, pre-critical. We have these physiological impulses, unconscious, instinctual impulses. And then what do we do? We camouflage them, we decorate them, we, we costume them, we disguise them with our principles. Hmm, very interesting. And two people with the very same principles might have been led in that direction, might have been led to those 
principles for completely different instinctual and unconscious reasons. You know, it makes me think about conservatives, political conservatives and um, political liberals or liberalists, you know. Um, political conservatives might be congenitally submissive to authority. Maybe they had authoritarian mothers or authoritarian fathers, or maybe they didn't. Maybe, you see, this, is, this goes back into the difference of the, the impetus, the impetus behind what, the choice of one's principles. Again, the choice is not a conscious choice. It, it's, it's an arbitrary choice, you know, it's, it's an unconscious choice. But, but what if one has an authoritative, not authoritative, what if one has an authoritarian parent? You're going, we are going to see grandma get in the station wagon, get in the Oldsmobile, get in the SUV right now. Put down that Xbox. We're going to see grandma. We're going to, we're going to drive to grandma's house, whether you want to or not. And then from that experience, the child, whether boy or girl or whatever, becomes more politically conservative, but maybe not. Maybe the child will grow up will grow up into an adult that swings into the opposite direction politically. Maybe the child will have an aversion to authority and become a liberal. How many times have I met people like this? You talk to them, they're politically liberal, and you ask them about their families. If you're, I mean, be careful, you don't want to be invasive, but um, if the subject of the conversation drifts to their families, very often they'll say, I was raised conservative, and so I became a liberal. But sometimes, maybe because of a person's genetic constitution, the child reflects the father or the mother or the father and the mother. But in my experience, which I know is minuscule, it's microscopic, it's infinitesimal, usually people deflect away from their upbringing especially if they have active minds, you know. I think those with less active minds tend to simply reflect their heritage, their upbringing, and they, they kind of uncritically repeat the political impulses, the political principles, the political tenets of their biological progenitors. That's usually how it is. Again, I think that aphorism had a deep impression, left a deep impression on Freud. I mean, I, I surmise. Who did believe that most intellectual activity is unconscious. And now neurophysiology, neuroscience has proven that. The vast preponderance, the overwhelming majority of our thinking is unconscious. And so what do we do? We sublimate we sublimate our unconscious impulses by, again, dressing them up as intellectual principles. But these principles are not pure. They come from a very murky, muddy, obscure place. 78. People who reproach themselves still respect themselves as reproachers. You know, this reminds me of both self-deprecation and self-denigration. Um, how many people have you met who talk about how worthless they are, how insignificant they are, how they feel as if they were nothing, but they're still talking to you. And by talking to you about the nothingness that they're pretending to be, they're converting that nothingness into a positivity. They're taking that negative and they're turning it into a positive by virtue of the fact that they're presenting it in the form of a linguistic statement. So anyone who says to you, I am lonely, is no longer lonely by virtue of the fact that that person is saying, I am lonely. Because, because by saying I am lonely, you are opening up communication. Communication avoids the void, right? You, you, a void is voided whenever communication takes place. 
So someone who reproaches oneself, rebukes oneself, criticizes oneself, censures oneself with a you, is really respecting oneself as the person who is making the statement. I am the promulgator, right? I am the proponent. I am the producer of a statement of my own negativity. But by virtue of that fact, I am transforming that negative into a positivity, a linguistic positivity, a communicative positivity, right? So in the very act of communication, the void is avoided, right? The nullity is nullified. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. 79, a soul which knows that it is loved, but does not itself love, betrays its sediment. That's S-E-D-I-M-E-N-T, sediment, right? What's at the bottom of the glass. Its lowest elements come up to the surface. So Nietzsche's alluding to a loveless person like Hamlet. I might be wrong about Hamlet. I mean, he did love his father. Or did he? Maybe he just loved the specter of his father, you know? Anyway, so a loveless person, maybe a sociopath, right? Although, although I've been thinking about sociopathy and, and reading about sociopathy, there might be an economy of sociopathy, right? In other words, maybe everyone has a modicum or at least a modicum of sociopathy in him or her, in oneself, right? In other words, in certain circumstances, you know, you might be watching a film or the news, you might not feel any empathy for the people who are depicted in the image. Well, that could be called a form of sociopathy. So does that mean that everyone has sociopathy, that everyone is a sociopath to a certain degree? Um, but in this case, maybe I'm mistaken, but Nietzsche seems to be referring to or alluding to a person who is really loveless, who is a card-carrying sociopath, which doesn't mean that, that this person knows that he or she is a sociopath. It just means that the person is the real deal, is a genuine sociopath. So this person has no empathy. But when this person is conscious of being loved, right, then the, the lowest elements, the hidden elements, the things that he or she wants to conceal, bubble up to the surface and are revealed to the sociopath, but also to those around him or her, right? 80, a matter that is explained ceases to concern us. What did the God mean? The God who gave the advice, know yourself. Did this perhaps mean don't be concerned with yourself, become objective? And Socrates, and what about the so-called person of knowledge, right? This is multi-layered. This is a very complex aphorism. Um, I might only be able to skip along the surface, but let me try to interpret this. Um, a matter that is explained ceases to concern us. So Nietzsche is here talking about interpretation. Interpretation is always geared toward an absence. We don't interpret things that are accessible to us. We interpret those things that are inaccessible to us. And once we sufficiently explain a matter, it ceases to be interesting, of course. And so that absence becomes a presence once it is explained, sure. But what about ourselves? Now, one of the things that Nietzsche writes about at great length, in what might be my favorite book of Nietzsche, Human All to Human, Menschliches All zu Menschliches, which really represents for me the beginning of the maturity of Nietzschean thought, right? At that point, Nietzsche really broke from Schopenhauer, more or less, and came into his own, blossomed as a thinker, anyway. One of the things that Nietzsche writes about in that great book, which all of you should read if you have not yet done so, is that human beings are self-concerned. We are self-related and self-concernedness 
lies at the bottom of all human conduct. Self-relatedness lies at the bottom of all human conduct. So we are basically selfish. We human beings are all, all human beings are selfish, right? And no matter how selfless we and other people think that we are, we are essentially self-related, right? But knowing oneself is not on the table because if we knew ourselves, we would know that we are self-concerned, self-preoccupied, narcissistic, maybe even solipsistic, but most of us don't know that, right? Um, we don't know ourselves. We, we, human beings are not accessible to themselves. The mind of a human being is not accessible to itself. And did this perhaps mean don't be concerned with yourself, become objective, right? Because we cannot know ourselves. Um, there is only a self unknowing for Nietzsche, or as I called it earlier, sorry to be redundant, a self misknowledge, right? And, and that what he's alluding to as well, the, the know thyself proclamation, that is the news from the Delphic Oracle, right? In ancient Greece. 81, it is terrible to die of thirst at sea. Is it necessary for you to salt your truth so that it will no longer slake thirst? 82, pity for everyone. That would be harshness and tyranny for you, my good neighbor. So <laughs> we have to be careful with this because when he writes you, he doesn't mean me. <laughs> he doesn't mean I. All right, let me try to explain. So if I am the one who is pitying, I am the pitier, that would be oppression, harshness, and tyranny for my neighbors. Because if I pity my neighbors, then, you know, I'm reducing them to objects of my pity. I, I'm, I'm, taking away, I'm taking away their dignity, I'm taking away their autonomy, you know. Whom do we pity? We pity wounded dogs and wounded cats. We pity homeless people. We pity people who are podcasting about philosophy on YouTube. We pity YouTubers. What a strange fate it is to talk about Nietzsche on YouTube. We, we pity these creatures, these organisms, because we feel that in some deep sense they are impaired they are um, defective, they are not on our level. And so the person who has pity is in a transcendent position because he or she, the pitier, may always withhold, withdraw, rescind, forbear, giving one's pity, right? So one may with, withhold, withdraw, rescind one's pity. One may forbear from dispensing one's pity, from giving one's pity, from granting one's pity, which means that the person who gives pity is the one with all of the power. And the person who is pitied really has no power. I mean, how many people have you met who, who said, don't pity me, don't, don't pity me, whatever you do. Yes, I'm going through a bad time right now. I'm going through a divorce, but um, don't pity me. Because if you pity me, you make me feel as if I were an object you make me feel as if I were subhuman, you know. It's not a pleasant thing to be pitied. Pity is really, if you're the object of pity, that's one of the worst insults. I mean, maybe there are, maybe there are more severe insults, more dehumanizing and depersonalizing insults, but there aren't many. 83, instinct. When the house is on fire, one forgets one's dinner. Yes, but then one retrieves it from the ashes. Yes, but then one retrieves it from the ashes. That's instinct, right? That's our unconscious impulse. Um, even though our house has been raised to the ground, that's R-A-Z-E-D, not raised, but raised to the ground, burned down to the ground. We're still going in there after the last embers have flickered out after the ashes have 
have accumulated, we're going to sift through the ashes and we're going to find our meal, right? That is instinct. 87, restrained heart, free spirit. What's the relationship between these two things, right? I'm sorry. When one restrains and imprisons the heart, one gives the spirit many freedoms. I said this once before, but no one believed me when I said so, except those who knew it already. Yeah, he, he has told us this before, and he's saying, unless you know this already, you're not going to believe me. Yeah, you have to restrain the heart to free the spirit, and that really means free the mind. And the rest will follow. Paragraph 88. One begins to distrust very clever persons when they become embarrassed. I don't think that requires my commentary. 89. Terrible experiences raise the suspicion whether the one who experiences them is also not something terrible. 90. Hatred and love lighten heavy melancholy people and bring them for a while to the surface, whereas the others are aggravated by hatred and by love. And they're aggravated, that doesn't mean the colloquial uh, sense of aggravation, which, which I would avoid. No, aggravation here means to make heavy, to make worse. 91, so cold, so glacial, that one burns one's finger on him. Every hand recoils that lays hold of him. And precisely for that reason, many think that he is glowingly hot. 92. Who has never, for the sake of one's good reputation, sacrificed oneself? 93. In amiability, there is no hatred of human beings but precisely for that reason, a great deal of contempt for human beings. So let me pause over this for just a moment. Um, well, let me pause over this, right? A pause is a moment. Um, what is the difference between hatred and contempt for Nietzsche? Hatred is an intense preoccupation. Hatred is an obsession. And as I've said elsewhere, um, Hatred is affine to love. It's closely related. To, hatred is closely related to love, right? I think that hatred and love are two dimensions of the same emotional complex. Now, contempt is something different. Not something completely different from hatred, but it's not the same. It's not the same. What, one should not conflate hatred with contempt. So I would say that contempt is hatred's icy cousin. And by the way, this is not just my own thinking. This is, this is based on the Nietzschean text. I mean, Nietzsche does write about contempt in this way. Die Verachtung is his word, die Verachtung, right? Which interestingly contains Achtung, which might be translated as respect and fair is privative, it's negative. The prefix is privative, it's negative, right? Interesting, interesting. Anyway, um, so he's saying that in amiability, right, superficial friendliness, that, that is to say formalized intimacy, intimate formality, right? When you're, when you're kind of cold and coldly friendly, to other people, you know, polite to other human being, to other human beings. Um, as we said last time, there's a great deal of malice that is ensconced in politeness, in polite formulae. You know, when someone seems to be polite, that really masks a great deal of, of contempt, really, a great deal of contempt. So in the case of contempt, one is not obsessed with the person of whom one is contemptuous. No, it's just a kind of sneering condescension. There's a real distance between 
the one who is contemptuous and the one who is regarded as contemptible, right? So if you find, if you're, if you are contemptuous of someone, if you find someone contemptible, then that person is not regarded as being on the same level as you. Whereas in a curious way, hatred, isn't there a kind of parody between the hater and the person whom one hates? Isn't there a kind of equalization, a kind of leveling off, a kind of linearity or a lateral attitude between the hater and the person one hates? Because if you think about it, we only hate people whom we care about in some way. I mean, we only hate people who have affected us and whom we consider worthy enough to be our enemies, right? I, I've said this many times, I, I, and I've, I just said it a, a few minutes ago, but hatred and love interpenetrate. They intermingle. They are intermeshed. They're not the same, but they are two sides of the same piece of paper, I think. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash that like button and hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell. I, I think I might be confusing my neighbors who are trying to have a party right now. Um, they're listening to me philosophize and, and they don't understand what I mean. Um, 94, the maturity of man. That means to have retrieved the earnestness that one had as a child at play. We talked a little bit about this last time. I mean, the Nietzschean chronology of the spirit, the three metamorphoses of the, of the mind, the three transformations of consciousness, and not with the old man, but with the child. And by the way, not that I care very much, but this is why Stanley Kubrick's somewhat overrated film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, ends with the star child, you know, the film from 1968 that is slightly overrated. Kubrick has better films than that. Um, I mean, if I want to see a light show, I'll go to the Adler Planetarium and see a light show. About, what is it, 30 minutes of that film is a light show? The film is overrated. I'm sorry. It, it is. But, but let me get to the main point, though, which is really a sub point. 2001 A Space Odyssey is a Nietzschean film. I mean, anyone who disbelieves this, just pay attention to the music, which is taken from Richard Strauss's Also Sprach Zarathustra, which is a tone poem, which is inspired, obviously, by Nietzsche's book, Also Sprach Zarathustra. Right. And not only that, I mean, if, if, if we were to give a deep reading of Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, I think all of us would agree that that is a Nietzschean film. But it also literalizes Nietzsche in a way that I'm not comfortable with. I, I'm not a forgive me. I'm not a big Stanley Kubrick fan. Do you know what I think his best film is? I think it's Full Metal Jacket from 1987. I think that's his best film. I also like Eyes Wide Shut, which I know no one else does, but but I, I would say probably if I were to give a sober um, film historical cinematic assessment, I would say Full Metal Jacket is Kubrick's best film. And in a strange way, it's more Nietzschean than 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is an overestimated film, again. 95. To be ashamed of one's immorality. This is a step on the ladder at the end of which one is ashamed also of one's morality. I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, I mean think of the Enlightenment thinkers, especially from France um, in the 18th century and earlier. People like Diderot and Voltaire and, and others who made fun of um, priests and bishops and popes and kings, you know, you know, and, and pointed to their, what they considered to be their immorality. Um, 
Nietzsche saw these people as immoralists, or as he later called them, moralists, in the sense that, it, let me, let me, I'm not being clear. So people like Diderot, Voltaire, who criticized priests, the clergy, nuns, bishops, popes, for not being as holy as they pretended to be, right? Um, these were cr critics of morals, right? They were moral critics, moralists in that sense. But the kind of moral critic that Nietzsche represents is, is Nietzsche. I mean, if you look at his books and read his books, Human All Too Human or Daybreak, then he goes very deeply, especially in Daybreak. Human All Too Human is just the precondition for Daybreak. In Daybreak, which you should read if you haven't read it yet. In Daybreak, that is a head-on critique of morality. And it's a great critique of morality. If you're interested in reading about that book, I have a whole essay on it. Um, but let me let me continue. So so I, I didn't get to the main point, but so if, if you point out the immorality of people in power, that's a stage on the way. It's a step on the ladder to completely dispensing with getting rid of morality altogether. And throwing down the ladder because you don't need the ladder anymore, right? You've reached the height, the height at which morality is now beneath you because it's perceived by you as being beneath you, right? Morality is nothing more for Nietzsche than a tool that one may use if one pleases. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to criticize people for their immorality, which is what he did in a sense, isn't it? I never thought of it this way, but think of it like he did that in Human All Too Human. He, he pointed out the selfishness that underlies human behavior, the self-concernedness, the, self of, of the self-relatedness that underlies all human conduct, conduct, including human conduct that is praised as being holy and virtuous or heroic. He pointed out how uh, heroes really have selfish motives, which surely they do. Uh, saints have selfish motives. You know, um, and, and then, but that's a step. That's a step on the ladder, which leads you to a certain height. And at that height, you are now above morality and you can dispense with the ladder and throw down the ladder, right? Okay. 96, one should separate from life as Ulysses separated from Nausicaa, blessingly instead of lovingly. So, I don't know if you remember, but in Homer's The Odyssey, um, he's called Ulysses here, but um, Odysseus, Odysseus on his homeward mission uh, is shipwrecked. He and his crew are shipwrecked, right? And strong Ulysses, strong Odysseus, powerful Odysseus swims to the shore of an island. And there, on the shore of the island, on the beach, are young women who are giggling because here you have this very muscular man who's covered in hair uh, and he's not clothed, right? And they're giggling, they're giggling. And Nausicaa takes care of him. Nausicaa heals his wounds. But Ulysses, I keep on saying Ulysses, the Latin, the Greek is of course Odysseus. Odysseus blesses her and is faithful, as far as we know, to his wife, Penelope, who is at home um, weaving her web, right? Weaving her web and um, rebuffing the attentions and the importunacies of her suitors who want Odysseus to die. One of the greatest poems ever written. I mean, I know it's, um, anyway. So, She's staving off the suitors who are trying to woo her, right? Trying to court her um, and, and wish for Odysseus to die. But Odysseus, as far as we can tell, is forever faithful. He's forever the, the faithful husband and really the model of being a good husband, right? Maybe even being the ideal husband. Um, he doesn't even let the witch Kerke, whom he definitely finds attractive, bewitch him. He doesn't let himself be enchanted by the sirens, right, who try to lure him to his watery 
destruction as the ship would crash against the rocks. So, I, I, okay, I'm sorry. The, the, the analogy here is Odysseus is faithful to his wife, Penelope. And he might think that Nausicaa is beautiful. I don't know. He might. But he doesn't cross the line with Nausicaa. He has, he has an appropriate relationship with Nausicaa. He doesn't let things go too far, right? From what we can tell. Um, and he parts from her by blessing her. He doesn't love her. He doesn't go, he doesn't cross a line, right? But he blesses her. Now, what is all of this about? Is it just about Odysseus and Nausicaa? No. This is an analogy that Nietzsche is drawing about the relationship between the ideal human being and his or her mortality, right? This is how the ideal human being should comport oneself toward one's coming death. So we all know we're going to die. We're, we are mortal, right? How should we leave this life? How should we depart from this world? Well, by blessing life, by saying, I, I'm very grateful. I am very grateful to have lived. It is a blessing to have lived. But I'm not going to cling to life. Now, you might wonder, well, where's the clinging? Where's the adhesion? Well, it's in love. As I've said at least three times now, love is a form of obsession. Of course it is. You know, the lover is obsessed with the one whom he or she loves. And so there's a kind of adhesive clinging. One adheres to the beloved, whoever, whoever the beloved might be. And so the beloved in this analogy would be life. Don't cling to life. Bless life as you approach your own finitude, your own end, your death. 97, how is that? A great man? No, each time I only see the actor of his ideal. My goodness, I've been thinking a great deal about that um, throughout this quarantine. That, you know, you see these political leaders who um, style themselves as great human beings and want you to believe that they are great human beings. And you see celebrities doing the same thing, and talk show hosts. I don't know when you're going to be watching this video, but if you're watching this video in 2020, who's still watching in 2020? You might agree with me. Um, but are they really great human beings or are they just actors of their own ideals? I think the latter, but I'll let you decide. 98, when one trains the conscience, it kisses us at the same time that it bites. So don't let guilt drag you down into the waves, into the deeps, into the fathoms, right? Don't let that happen. Whenever your conscience bites you, put some sugar on it. <laughs> you know, don't let it, don't let it bring you down, to quote Neil Young. <laughs> um, 99, the disappointed one speaks, quote, I listened for an echo and I heard only praise. Yeah, Nietzsche writes about this uh, in another book, and I'm sorry, I don't remember where, but um, very famous and accomplished artists and performers are not flattered when you say to them, I love your work. I've met a few celebrities in my life. Um, I met Keanu Reeves once, and I was very careful not to praise him. I've made that mistake before with another celebrity, but I didn't praise Keanu Reeves. We just had a brief but meaningful conversation, and I regarded him as an equal. Um, you know, and I think Nietzsche is referring to accomplished people, because he, he wrote about them in another book, and I'm sorry, I don't remember. I think it might have been The Gay Science. I, I don't know. I don't know. But one of the things, just to paraphrase Nietzsche, truly accomplished people are not flattered by praise. They might be indulgent and say, oh, thank you very much, but they're not flattered when you praise them. No, the best way to comport oneself to them is by echoing them because they're narcissists, right? Narcissists live for one thing and that is their own echo, right? They're not looking for praise, but echoes. 
100. We all pretend to ourselves to be simpler than we are. Isn't this what the Prime Minister of Great Britain called um, imbecilio? I, I'm sorry, I hope I don't get this wrong, but um, imbecilio, he, he made up a, a rhetorical trope, but he called it imbecilio, which is pretending to be dumb even though one isn't. I just call it irony because that's the original meaning of irony, right? Ironia means to pretend that one is innocent or one is ignorant, even though one is not. As I said before, it's a willful disingenuousness. But So does that mean that we're all ironic? We are all ironists? Maybe. He goes on in, in 100. We relax ourselves from our fellow human beings thereby. Yeah, because if we pretend or show ourselves to be smart when we are smart, that's not a very relaxing or peaceful or peaceable situation in which to find oneself. It's quite strenuous, isn't it, to always have to be smart? I mean, I can tell you it's fatiguing being on camera and trying to be intelligent. It's not much fun. But I do it for you, whoever you are. 101. A person of knowledge could easily feel himself or herself these days to be the animalization of God. Wow. I mean, you see this if you read also Sprach Zarathustra, which is the book that came right before this one, Beyond Good and Evil. Nietzsche um, derides the so-called higher human beings in book four of, of also Sprach Zarathustra, which was published after this book, but anyway. Um, and, and the humanists, he really means the humanists. The higher human beings are the humanists. And the humanists are those who have deified knowledge. Humanists are those who have turned scholarship, research, knowledge, the epistem, into God, into a God, which they worship. As the higher men worship the donkey in the cave, spoiler alert, at the end of also also Sprach Zarathustra. 102, the discovery of mutual love should really make the lover sober about the beloved. Wow. How is this possible? The person you love is unpresumptuous enough to love even you, or stupid enough, or, or I forget who it was. There's a French philosopher who wrote a book on love. It's not a Lenbaju whose book I love, by the way, you should read it if you haven't already. It's called In Defense of Love, or no, I think it's called In Praise of Love. I'm sorry. Alain Badjou's In Praise of Love. I'm pretty sure that's the title of the book. It's a great book, but it's a different French philosopher whose name, I've struggled for two years to remember who this was, and I can't remember, but it doesn't matter because Nietzsche wrote the same thing as he did years before. Whoever this French philosopher was, was just repeating Nietzsche when he wrote the same thing. Um, when you discover that the beloved loves you back, when you discover that there's reciprocal love between you and the person in whom you had a, in whom you were in love unrequitedly, when you, when your love is returned, when you receive recompense for your love, which was previously unrequited, unreciprocated love. You feel disappointed. Wait, he or she thinks that I am worthy of his or her love? Well, then that person is not worthy of my love. So when you get love back from the person you pined over, you languished over, then you're disappointed because you think, well, that person isn't all that in a bag of barbecue potato chips because how could he or she love me? I mean, there's a kind of self-hatred, maybe even a certain masochism at the heart of unrequited love, isn't there? Think about it. 103, the danger and fortune. Now everything is turning out for the best for me. From now on, I love every fate. Uh, who would like to be my fate? So finally, your life is working out for you. And now you look around you and you're all alone. Quite sad. 
104. It is not their love of humanity, but the impotence of their love of humanity that prevents the Christians of today from burning us. No comment. I'm going to move on. 105. The Pia Fraus, the pious fraud. The, the pious fraud is even more against the taste of the free spirit, the man of knowledge against his piety, than the impious fraud, the impia fraus. Thereupon the profound lack of understanding with respect to the church, which is characteristic of the free spirit types, this is their unfreedom. Hmm. 106, by means of music, the passions enjoy themselves. Beautiful. 107, once the decision has been made to close the ear against even the best counter arguments, sign of a strong character. Therefore, an occasional will to stupidity. 108, there are no moral phenomena, only a moral interpretation of phenomena. I mean, that's probably the clearest, the clearest statement I've read on Nietzsche's stance toward morality, conventional morality, not the morality of the overhuman, of, of overhumanity, but that's, that's clear. Let me read it once more. I, I think I just have to read it, recite it. There are no moral phenomena, only a moral interpretation of phenomena. This sounds a bit like what Nietzsche will write later in his latest notebooks before he lost his lucidity, sadly. Um, there is no truth. There is only the interpretation of truth. I have a problem with that statement, which I'll talk about later. 109, the criminal is often enough not equal to his deed. He lessens or maligns it, he or she. 110, the advocates of a criminal are seldom artists enough to turn the beautiful terribleness of the deed to the advantage of the doer. Murderer as artist. I think, you know, it certainly was, wasn't it? Um, it was De Quincey who wrote an essay on the aesthetics of murder. And this is certainly the subject of many, many films, isn't it? The idea of the murderer as an artist. Ugh. I don't know. I think I'm becoming more sensitive the older I become. I don't know why, but when I was younger, I could watch films like that. I'm too sensitive now, I guess. Um, 111. Our vanity is most difficult to wound just when our very pride has been wounded. We need to talk about this. So what is the difference between vanity and pride then, and which is more fundamental? Well, Let's, let's give a definition. This is not me, this is Nietzsche. I, I, Nietzsche writes about this elsewhere, but pride means you feel yourself to be everything and everyone else is nothing, or they might as well be nothing, right? It doesn't matter whether or not they're nothing or something. You feel yourself as something, something special, something important. You have respect for yourself, you have dignity. That's pride. Vanity is different. Vanity is when you feel that you are nothing and everybody else is everything and you need their gazes to uh, paraphrase Woody Allen's um, film. I, I, um, what was that film called? Interiors, I think it was called. Interiors. There's a character that's, that says this, I'm just paraphrasing, that you only see yourself through the gazes of others. That, that's a vain person, right? A vain person is someone who only sees oneself through the, through the vision, through the gazes of other people, of other human beings. And um, a vain person thinks that he or she is nothing and everyone else matters, not, not the person who is vain. So you could probably guess um, the more fundamental phenomenon is um, in this phenomenology is, is pride, right? Pride is more fundamental than vanity. That's really what Nietzsche means here. 
112, to whomever feels preordained to contemplation and not to faith, all believers are too noisy and obtrusive. He guards against them. Well, I think you could tell which um, experience Nietzsche values more highly. He values contemplation above faith, right? Obviously. Faith for Nietzsche is too submissive. It's too obedient. Whereas contemplation, in this sense, means taking a distance, thinking about things, thinking about an object, whatever that object might be. So he prizes contemplation above faith, clearly. 113. You want to take him in, then you must be embarrassed before him. Um, I've said this before. I don't think Nietzsche hated women. I think he loved women, but sometimes he, he became misogynistic, but sometimes he wasn't. Um, Nietzsche's attitude toward women is very complex. Sometimes he's a feminist or a crypto-feminist, if you'd like, a, a, or a phylogenist, right? A phylogenist means a lover of women. Sometimes he's a misogynist, which I don't approve of at all. Not at all. I can't stand that Nietzsche. Uh, Derrida wrote about this in his book, Spurs. And I've written about this at, at I mean, at fairly great length. Um, if, you, if you want to read about my, my take on Nietzsche's attitude toward women, you should read my essay on Human All Too Human, um, which is available for free online. Um, but let me get to the main point. I, I believe my interpretation is that this is the counsel, the advice given by a mother to her daughter. And she's saying, you daughter, you want to take him in, this boy you like, or this man you like, then you must be embarrassed before him. Obviously, you can't command someone to be embarrassed. How could you do that? But you may command someone, you can command someone to appear to be embarrassed, to pretend to be embarrassed. So in other words, Nietzsche seems to be saying, um, the mother is advising the daughter to pretend to be awkward and clumsy, even though she's very poised and elegant, so that the boy or the man doesn't feel insecure. I mean, I, I, I think this is Nietzschean feminism. I don't, I mean, it is, isn't it? 116. People like this one. Um, the great epochs of our life reside in those moments wherein we win the courage to rebaptize our badness as our best. I mean, people I've cited this to like it. Um, I don't know why this aphorism isn't more famous than it is. It isn't very famous at all. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't really re require my commentary, does it? Um, 117, the will to overcome an affect with an A is ultimately only the will of another affect or the will of several other affects. We talked about this before. It's the idea that the will is complex and has many different valences, many different dimensions. The will is not a simple thing, right? It's not even a thing. 118, there is an innocence of admiration. It is possessed by him on whom it is not yet dawned that he himself might one day be admired. 118, there is an innocence of admiration. It is possessed by him on whom it has not yet dawned that he or she might him or herself one day be admired. Um, Try to imagine um, a small time celebrity, like a Walmart celebrity, um, what do they call them, a, a C-lister or a D-list celebrity, right? Someone who is relatively obscure, but still a celebrity. The person still has an IMDB page and maybe had a cameo in a Martin Scorsese film or something, was an extra or something in a Martin Scorsese film, but an extra with a line. Um, this person, try to imagine this person, collects signed photographs and takes selfies, I hate that word, but selfies, of him or herself with a celebrity, posing with a celebrity. So this person admires the celebrity. Why? Because 
the D-list actor sees him or herself as being beneath the A-lister, right? The, the, the truly famous celebrity, right? But then one day, the D-list celebrity makes it big, becomes truly famous, and then is admired because in his or her former life, in his or her past life, that relatively obscure celebrity never dreamed of being admired. So your admiration for others dies once you become the cynosure, cynosure, right, of the admiration of the masses, of the crowd. There it is. When their desires are cathected in you. Um, 119, the disgust of filth can be so great as to prevent us from cleaning ourselves, from justifying ourselves. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? I mean, by the way, so true doesn't mean, I, I, that means I agree with it. Um, you know, someone who is going on and on about degeneracy and filth and immoral behavior, then kind of puts a screen before him or herself and says, well, you can't judge me. I don't have to defend myself because what am I doing? I'm moralizing and I'm condemning the so-called degeneracy and corruption and filth around me in other human beings that, that I claim is there. I'm not saying it is there, but the moralist claims that that corruption is there, that depravity is there. So then he or she has a screen behind which to hide oneself. Interesting. 120. Sensuality often outspeeds the growth of love so much that its root remains weak and easily extirpable. Imagine two plants. No, no. No, no. Imagine a flower and a weed. Okay. So there's a, a, a beautiful let's say a yellow rose, right? I don't know why it's yellow, but it's a yellow rose. And the yellow rose blossoms and blossoms, but beside it, there is a weed, and the weed grows and flourishes and spreads its tendrils everywhere, right? It overgrows and outspeeds the growth of the rose, right? So the weed dominates the rose and thus makes the root of the rose easily extirpable. That just means it's easily uprootable, right? So it, what happens is, but we, we are, we're getting, this is, this is analogy blindness, isn't it? Sometimes you can get so lost in the image of an analogy that you forget what it is being compared to. So what Nietzsche is comparing this to is sensuality versus love. If there is too much voluptuousness, too much sensuality, carnal desire in a relationship between two people, then that could squash love, right? If it's all about sensuality. How many times is that how many times has that happened? I'm sure that's never happened before, right? Never, never ever has that happened, right? 121. It is a delicate matter that God learned Greek when he wished to turn writer and that he did not learn it better. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a brutal criticism. Um, interestingly enough, um, some biblical scholars think that the New Testament, the so-called New Testament, the, the, the Christian Bible, and that's what Nietzsche is alluding to. Um, was not written in Greek originally. It was written, they say, some of them say, in Aramaic, because Jesus and the apostles spoke Aramaic, not Greek, but it was probably translated into Greek afterward, right? We know that now. Um, but there's something else that Nietzsche did know. I mean, the one thing that Nietzsche lived to see, though, was the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation by Christians or for the benefit of Christians of the Hebraic Bible. So it was, again, a Greek translation of the Hebraic Bible into Greek. 
and Nietzsche hated the Septuagint. He wrote about this in, a, in another book, in an earlier book. I'm sorry, but I don't remember which book it was, which book of Nietzsche it was. But Nietzsche's criticism is that it was really bad philology. In fact, it was a scandal for him. It was an abomination for him because it wasn't just a translation and it wasn't really a responsible translation at all of the Hebrew, in particular, so the Hebraic Bible part of the, of the Christian Bible. Because what happened was the translators of, of the Septuagint inserted twigs and branches, especially in the book of Isaiah. And do you know why that was? Do you know why? You want to tell me? Why was that? Because the twigs and the branches were the precursors of the crucifix, the rood, right? The cross. This was a way of arguing by way of a dishonest translation that the so-called Old Testament paved the way, anticipated, predicted the New Testament and, and the coming Messiah which Jews don't believe in. And so Nietzsche was enraged by this. I don't know if he ever got over his rage. Um, you know, this really should be more well known, I think. It is strange though. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe in this aphorism, maybe Nietzsche is alluding to the Septuagint. He very well might be. It's very likely that he is. 122, to rejoice when one is praised is for many merely a kind of politeness of the heart and the very opposite of vanity of the spirit. We've talked about that before. 123, even concubinage has been corrupted by marriage. Even concubinage has been corrupted pause by marriage. 124, who exalts at the stake does not triumph over pain, but triumphs over the fact that no pain is felt where it was expected. A parable, my goodness, I love this aphorism. You know, I, I know this is not a famous aphorism. There are, there, as, as we'll see, there are some very famous aphorisms here that find their way into songs, into MySpace, profiles and which I know isn't around anymore and Facebook profiles and you know on Twitter but but this deserves to be famous this one the person who exalts at the stake is triumphant right so the person who's burning at the stake like Joan of Arc Saint Joan of Arc she's burning at the saint uh, she's burning at the stake or think of a saint or someone who's decried as a heretic, right? Um, nor are those scientists, right? I forget the name of the scientist who was burned at the stake, but contributed so heavily to the history of science. I forget his name. But the heretic is burned at the stake, right? And he or she is triumphant, is glowing, not just with fire, but glowing in exaltation, is exalting, right? Is exultant. Why? Because this martyr, as it were, this martyr slash heretic is triumphing over pain because the pain is not as bad as we think it will be. Pain largely comes from the mind and the triumph is when you think this is not as bad as I thought. Remember what Nietzsche writes elsewhere and many people know this, even those who have not read Nietzsche, this is a famous statement that came from Nietzsche. The one who has a why can endure any how. In other words, if you have a purpose, a logos, if you have a sense of directionality, if you have a sense of the future, you can endure any suffering, any pain. That's the parable, I believe. That is what is beneath this parable, right? I see that the screen is becoming gelatinous. I feel as if I'm wading through jello. So maybe I should end the stream soon just in case. I don't want to lose any of this footage. So um, let me actually end it here just in case.